can see the chat now. Okay, I'm going to start off with one or two just general points um, that um, have been given to me as suggestions, which I think made a good starting place for discussing winter infections. So can common winter viruses make disabled children more likely to get bacterial infections like group A strep? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, often bacterial infections do get in on the back of viral infections. So you might have a cold virus, um, one of many, many cold viruses that affect children at this time of the year, such as RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, which mostly affects babies, but can affect any children or even adults with just a cold, uh, cold symptoms. Um, adenovirus, rhinovirus, the common cold, um, <coughs> human metanumovirus, um, flu virus, para-influenza virus, um, and there are many others as well. And often they get into the body system and they cause inflammation, particularly in the linings of the nose and throat and the air passages. And it's through mm. the inflammation, the soreness line in the skin lining those parts of the respiratory tract, that bacteria can then get in and cause more significant infections and usually the bacterial infections are more serious they often last longer and they may have more serious complications so viruses certainly do make you more prone to bacterial infections and the common pattern is that a child may get a virus infection it lasts a few days a week they start to recover and then at 10 days two weeks they start to get worse again and that's often because a bacterial infection has set in the most common example is what we're particularly seeing this winter, which is with cold viruses, uh, particularly flu, um, coming in, causing inflammation in the body, and then as a consequence of that, group A strep gets in and causes more significant infection. Now usually we have flu over the winter months, January, February, and then we start to see group A streptococcal bacterial infections kicking in in March, April time. But everything is earlier this year. Um, we, our winter infection started back in August, September, when we first started seeing RSV causing infections, particularly bronchiolitis in babies. And so we've seen flu, and flu has actually filled many of the children's intensive care units around the country this winter, unfortunately. And as a following that flu, we've then seen the sort of effects of group A strep kicking in. Um, and group A strep is not new. It's been around for years, um, uh, as long as uh, certainly more years than I've been working as a doctor. And it comes around every winter, but we do have some winters where it's a lot worse. Um, and this is one of those winters um, about five, ten, perhaps up even 20% of children will carry group A strep. So it's, it's around and everywhere. It's very common. Uh, and there's probably individual susceptibilities that make some people suffer particularly badly with it. I don't think, as a rule, disabled children from all the different conditions that they have are necessarily more at risk of group A strep, but the different types of neurodisability that children can have can make them more prone to getting more seriously ill with it because either they cannot cough properly or because when they get an infection food may go down the wrong way or secretions may go down the wrong way and into the lungs and make them more prone to infection or it may be that there are some subtle <coughs> immune differences that make some children with for example, syndromes such as Down syndrome, more prone to getting respiratory illness over the winter. So certainly disabled children can often get viruses and then get a bacterial infection on the top, just in the same way that otherwise healthy children can do. Um, 
Another question that's been asked is what are common complications associated with disabled children getting bacterial infections on top of viral infections? Well, it, um, colds and uh, other viruses can cause sore throats uh, such as pharyngitis, tonsillitis. Uh, colds, also known as acute viral rhinitis, um, and may cause a hoarse voice, laryngitis, and may cause a chesty cough, bronchitis. <coughs> but bacterial infections may also cause more serious infections with pneumonia. Sometimes those are just labelled as chest infections, um, and those can be more serious, as I've pointed out, in children with neurodisability, particularly if there's any weakness, floppiness, uh, muscle incoordination, hypotonia as is, is, is another word we uh, use for weak muscles that mean that you cannot clear secretions as adequately uh, from your chest. Um, but these bacteria, including bacteria like group A strep, don't just affect the respiratory system, they can cause joint infections, they can cause meningitis, brain abscesses, um, uh, bone infections, uh, all sorts of quite serious infect deep infections in the body. Um, most of those other more serious infections are actually uncommon or rare, um, but the bronchitis and the pneumonia is a more common consequence. I'm going to just go down and start to have a look at some of the questions that um, I've been asked. Um, <clears throat> so my son has a chest infection, he's on antibiotics, the GP says have days off school but he's gone to school as school is strict. Deep down I want him to go, didn't want him to go to school as the worry about spreading it. Yeah, um, it is a difficult one. When do you return to school when you've had a chest infection. Um, certainly if you think, if it's been thought that it's a bacterial infection and you've started antibiotics, often 24 hours after starting the antibiotic you're less likely to be infectious to other people um, and therefore contact is okay. And that inclu includes um, group A strep. So if you've been put on to antibiotics for that you're likely to be able to have contact within 24, 48 hours. Uh, of course, group A strep isn't always diagnosed and all you have is a chesty cough and the, that's been going on for a while, maybe with or without fever or sore throat, and you've just had a diagnosis in your child of bronchitis or chest infection. Um, and when is it appropriate? Well, as I say, if you had antibiotics, then uh, if it was bacterial, you're likely to be able to have contact quite quickly. If it's viral, it's much more difficult because we do know that viruses hang around sometimes for quite a while. Um, and we know from our experience, for example, with COVID in the last uh, two, three years, that if you get COVID, um, you may remain infectious for particularly five to seven days but the actual, the genetic material can hang around for a lot longer than that, um, which is why sometimes the tests stay positive for quite a long while. Usually once you're over the, really the acute part of the infection with the high temperatures really feeling unwell and miserable, once you're over that and start to fit, feel healthier and fitter, um, you're less likely to be infectious. And so if a child is actually well enough <clears throat> able to eat and drink, able to move around okay, uh, and they feel better again, it's likely that their infectivity has reduced substantially and it probably is okay that they do go back to school. Um, let me look at some other questions. Um, my son has not been to school due to his complex knees, he's had a sore throat, difficulties with swallowing on and off, some kind of small, I think semolina-like rash is probably a predictive text mistake and I suspect it's scarlatina. Um, 
UTIs and diarrhea, still can't take any swab from his throat to check. And when he has been taking antibiotics, then only for no more than five days, even so for suspected strep A in the leaflet, it says you should take the antibiotic for 10 days at least. That's absolutely true. Um, if it's thought to be group A strep because you've had a raging sore throat, high temperature um, uh, and sore throat, then the recommendation is that you have antibiotics for 10 days. Um, and that can actually be the case for other children who have other bacterial infections. If, if the child is still really quite unwell, still spiking temperatures above 38.5, 39, five days after starting antibiotics, it may be that that course should be extended to 10 days. Um, and in some children, particularly children with neurodisability, we go on for 10 days, two weeks. In children, for example, who have neuromuscular disorders, we often say when they get a bronchitis that they probably should have two weeks, 14 days of antibiotics. So if your child hasn't settled, don't be afraid to give your GP a call or go back to your GP and say, look, they're not settling. Can this course be extended up to 10 days um, or even 14 days in certain cases? Uh, my son has, oh, I think we've dealt with that one. My son is on azithromycin as prophylaxis regularly. Would this help to prevent such infections? Simple answer is yes. Azithromycin is the antibiotic most commonly used in children with underlying neurodisability to prevent them getting repeated chest infections. <clears throat> it's um, generally very well tolerated. And it's only taken three times a week, so it's quite long acting. And the usual pattern with it is that we give it for uh, on once a, once a day on Monday, Wednesday and Friday every week. So it's just three doses each week. It works as an antibiotic, but it also has effects at reducing inflammation in the respiratory tract. <clears throat> so it's very useful for managing children who have long term or continuous chest problems. Um, it is possible if you're on azithromycin, if you do get a bad chest infection, to increase the dose to just once daily for say five days continuously or seven days continuously instead of the three times a week. And that can often hit common or garden bacterial infections that are on your chest, uh, on the head, so that you can then just go back to taking it three times a week. So that's a, a little tip you can do with azithromycin if uh, you do have a child who's on that on a regular basis. Another question, are there any vitamin supplements we should be giving our children, such as zinc? Um, well, the national recommendation is that all children up to five should receive vitamin supplements such as Abidec um, 0.6 mils once daily or Dalavit daily. Um, that is a, a sort of a universal recommendation if you like. Um, but actually in the UK most children are going to be on diets that provide sufficient vitamin supplements. And that includes children with neurodis neurodisability and mostly includes children with uh, who are having tube feeds, who are on nasogastric, nasogestional feeds or gastrostomy feeds, whether you're on a blended diet or whether you're on formula feeds, um, usually you will have sufficient vitamins and if not, hopefully you will have seen a dietitian who will provide guidance and be telling you if you should be on vitamin supplements. Children above five don't usually need vitamin supplements and there's no evidence that going on additional vitamin supplements reduces your likelihood of respiratory infections. Um, so if you're on a balanced diet, you know that usually is good enough um, in terms of protection. I have another question. My autistic son's nose keeps running with bits of blood in it where he's picking his nose maybe. Um, <clears throat> my boy does it and sometimes it's through blowing his nose yes the reason you get blood 
from the nose is that when you have inflammation in the nose, the skin lining the nose gets in, um, swollen slightly and the blood vessels become more prominent inside the nose and many of the blood vessels inside the nose are quite fine and delicate and it makes it more easy for them to break or burst and that is particularly the case if a finger is put up the nose and rubs the skin it's particularly the case if um, a, uh, a child is blowing very intensely um, to make their nose uh, bleed um, and the advice really should be to try and discourage nose picking or fingers up noses um, where possible um, and if they are blowing their nose um, then to try and do it uh, slow and gently rather than doing it too hard. Um, usually when infections have gone the nose bleeding stops um, but if you have had a bad lot of nose bleeding some blood may well be swallowed and that can sometimes upset the tummy and sometimes the child can vomit and bring up blood and that can be alarming um, sometimes it can result in what is thought to be the child coughing up blood even but I'm afraid nosebleeds are a common part and parcel of having um, respiratory infections <coughs> um, do children with special needs have priority for flu? Um, there's something more there, but I can't quite see that at the moment. Um, his six doesn't attend school. He's got special needs. He's um, at his GPs. I phoned them and explained, and they booked him in. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, my recommendation is that all children between two years and 16 should have flu ideally for most children this will be available at their school and if they've missed it make sure you get your child immunized either on a school catch-up visit or at your GPs and for the younger children uh, this is done at the general practice surgery and I would strongly encourage flu immunization um, for younger children this will mean two doses four weeks apart if they've never had it before. If they have had it before um, it will mean one dose and it, it needs to be done every single year because the strains change every year. And I would strongly recommend this because flu alone is making a lot of children very very ill this year. Um, and even in normal healthy children it can cause very serious illness uh, and can cause death. Fortunately, that's rare, um, but it is important to have your child immunized against flu. Um, it may not stop them getting other viruses. It may not stop them getting bacterial chest infections. However, having just said that, there is some evidence that if your child has flu immunization, it reduces the risk of group A strep kicking in afterwards. <clears throat> so another good reason for getting flu immunization. It can be given as an injection, and that's what's available for six months to two years for children with special needs. From two years of age onwards, the nasal vaccine, um, the spray is perfectly adequate. <coughs> it's very good um, <coughs> and it provides good protection against flu virus. If anything, it may actually be even better than the injection. Um, but if they can't have the flu spray, then having the injection in the arm is a good idea. Um, now I'm just looking down at other questions. My, how often should a child with autoimmune condition get boosted or vaccinated for COVID? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the answer is we don't really know. Um, <coughs> um, they should have at least had uh, two or three vaccinations to COVID. Um, and I guess if they have underlying medical conditions, they probably should have had four or even five immunizations now. Um, what's going to happen in the future is a bit unknown. Um, I suspect we will be having annual flu jabs from here on. But I can say that COVID does not seem to be causing a big problem in, in terms of the need for intensive care or causing deaths. 
And it has never been a big issue for children. So um, although, yes, get your child immunized to COVID, it's not such a, such a worry as flu. And if, if it was one or the other, I would say you should definitely be getting flu immunization for your child. My son has <coughs> IgA blood deficiency. Um, I don't understand he's never had COVID. Um, IgA deficiency is a, it's a reduction in immunoglobulin A, which is one of the antibodies in the bloodstream that we can measure. It's important because IgA is also one of the antibodies that lines the nose, throat, uh, the gut, and the respiratory tract down into the airways and lungs, and therefore is an antibody that fights many different sorts of infections. Um, and if you do have an IgA deficiency, you are more prone to getting bacterial infections um, in your respiratory tract, so bronchitis and, and pneumonia. So you do have susceptibilities. So again, immunizations is important. And if you have repeated infections, um, that is when a respiratory pediatrician would usually be considering should you go on to azithromycin as a preventative medicine. Um, another question. Since September and going back to school, the illness caught at school has been constant. What are your thoughts about protective measures being in place in school? Heap air filtration to reduce viruses spreading in the first place. My daughter's school attendance is 70%. There's such a focus on intent attendance. I feel schools prioritise attendance over health. I worry that sick children are being sent to school, which is causing the spread. Yeah. Schools do have a very strong focus on attendance um, and even a small reduction in attendance can be quite significant in terms of numbers of lessons missed um, and schools do like to have attendance above 95%. Um, it's a problem though in the winter, particularly if you have children with neurodisability and they're prone to getting bugs and so on. Um, and you can only hope that the school does have some um, acceptance that you know we are having a bad winter um, if you haven't yourself had some respiratory infection I'm sure you know someone who has um, and yet when they are acutely unwell they should not be going to school um, I think once they're over the really acute illness um, once the temperatures settling um, and they're able to eat and drink again and they're more like themselves back on their legs then usually returning to school is okay um, unfortunately they may well still have cough at that time um, and I'm sure the classrooms are full of children who are coughing at this time of the year um, and hopefully that's something that the, the schools will just have to accept um, my child has had two heart operations in the past. He's always been prone to chest infections and tonsils. He always gets sick when cold and windy. Um, that seems to be that message. Um, oh, Amanda's replied, you can contact your GP and ask them where your child can get the flu vaccine. Yeah, your GP practice should use mostly be able to provide it. Oh, how can I improve my child's immunity. It's very difficult. There's no single simple means to improving individual immunity. We all have individual susceptibilities. Um, and I, it's really about leading a healthy and active lifestyle. So keeping your child active is a good idea, using their muscles, using their lungs as best they are able. Uh, of course, for many children with neurodisability, that's not easy or straightforward at all because they don't have mobility. They may not have mobility, um, but using the lungs is, is important and having a good balanced diet is the other thing. An avoidance of cigarette smoke, which any cigarette smoke um, or air pollution can damage the lining of the respiratory tract and may reduce the, the local immunity that is provided in the airways um, and lungs. Um, but there's no sort of simple nutritional supplement that's going to suddenly 
provide a magic boost. There's no sort of tonic. Um, if my non-verbal child has a chest infection or chesty cough, should I wait the NHS recommend a three weeks until I consult a doctor or would it be advisable to seek advice earlier because he is vulnerable? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think if they have neurodisability, neurodiversity, um, maybe their communication abilities are not what a normal child would be, um, I think it makes sense to consult sooner. It's very difficult to give a cut-off time in days, hours or weeks as to say this is when you should consult your doctor because it depends on what symptoms you have, the number of symptoms you have, how badly they are affecting the child. So having absolute cutoffs is very difficult. Um, I would usually say that if you've got a fever going on for five days or longer, you should be getting medical advice. If you've got a very high temperature, then maybe you shouldn't be waiting five days. You should be seeking advice straight away. If the child is really not themselves and they're not behaving like themselves, and they don't interact in the normal way, then again, that's a more serious feature and you should probably be seeking medical advice sooner rather than waiting. If your child is um, eating and drinking and interacting with you normally, then if they're chesty, you can wait. Um, you don't have to rush to their child, uh, to, to the, uh, your GP. It's unlikely they're gonna come to any major harm. Um, and you could certainly wait two to three weeks before seeking medical advice. If you look at the natural history of colds, um, most people think colds last just a few days, but actually in children, the evidence is that colds last seven days um, and they can certainly last up to two weeks. And if a cold does cause a bit of chestiness and a chesty cough, that can last up to three weeks. We start to say a cough uh, chestiness is prolonged at three weeks and it's a chronic cough once it's been going on for six weeks. So yeah, it's not a straightforward answer. It rather depends on the combination of symptoms. But if you do get very worried about your child, then yeah, don't wait three weeks. My daughter has a reaction to amoxicillin and apparently can't take erythromycin due to taking Tegretol for epilepsy. Is there an alternative? Um, yes. Um, firstly, amoxicillin, or in reaction to amoxicillin. Um, amoxicillin is a penicillin-like antibiotic. So penicillin, amoxicillin, um, coamoxiclav, are the penicillin antibiotics that are most commonly used. More than 95 or 98% of reported allergic reactions to amoxicillin or penicillin are not true allergic reactions. You can get this tested in your local hospital. Usually if there's an allergy service that can be tested. So you can rule out an allergy to penicillin and this allows them to have penicillin, amoxicillin or coamoxiclav in the future. Um, allergic reactions, getting diarrhea, for example, when you have take a penicillin antibiotic, that is not an allergic reaction. That's just a side effect of the antibiotic. But there are plenty of alternatives to penicillin antibiotics. And that includes a group of antibiotics called macrolides, which includes erythromycin clarithromycin and azithromycin which you've heard me talk about already as being used for long-term prevention. Um, but if you can't take those, um, for example because it might have an effect on the liver enzymes and other drugs that you're taking, there are other antibiotics as well. So for example there's a group of antibiotics called cephalosporins which include, include cephachlor, cephalexin, um, kefataxime um, and they can be taken um, uh, and there are some other antibiotics like septrin or cotrimoxazole that can be used that can also treat respiratory infections. 
Um, oh, just while I'm on antibiotics, I mean, I don't know whether it's in the list of questions, but um, there has been reports of shortages. Um, it's partly because there's a very high demand at the moment, um, and it's the shortages that have occurred have largely been in the provision of suspensions, the liquid medicines that are used particularly for children who are young, under five and can't take tablets, and also the children with neurodisability and those children who use tubes for feeding. Um, but there are alternative ways of getting antibiotics if you are needing to give this to your child. Um, and it's um, in Wales, in fact, that they have produced some very good information leaflets, both for families and also for health professionals, that show that antibiotics like amoxicillin, um, kermoxiclav, erythromycin, um, clarithromycin, um, kefchlor, kefalexin, all of these medicines, you can take the tablets or capsules and um, either crush tablets or open capsules and use them in a way that allows you to give the medicine in a bit of water so that the antibiotic can be given if suspension is not available. Another question, my son has cerebral palsy and asthma, is cold air good or bad? I want to take him out on his trike but I'm scared he will get ill again. Yeah, I mean if you put any of us into the middle of the Antarctic, you know, minus 25, minus 45 degrees C, the cold air will have a physical effect in our air passages and can make us cough or wheeze and cause airway narrowing. And different people have different susceptibilities to this. So we know that 10% of children get asthma and often cold air is a trigger that makes their airways get tighter and narrower. But I think you have to know whether cold air is a trigger in your child or not. Um, and there are so many advantages to getting out into cold air, doing some activity and getting fresh air on your face. Actually, fresh air on your face makes you breathe more. It stimulates the breathing. And of course, if you are going outside, usually you're moving around, you're walking around, uh, you may be running around. Um, and, and just the feeling of air on the face will make you breathe better. So. There's definitely positives for getting out and getting some fresh air. But if they do suffer from asthma, um, learn as to what sort of degree of cold air is going to make them have a problem. It may be that at sort of 5 to 10 degrees it's not a problem, but once you start getting down to 0 degrees plus or minus 2, then that may be when they start to have problems and you might want to protect them when they have, we are having a particularly cold snap. Um, what is your view of neutravene, high-dose antioxidants to help? I don't know what neutravene is. Um, high-dose antioxidants, I don't know that there's strong evidence that they help. Um, it could be argued that high-dose vitamin C is one such example of an antioxidant. Um, and it's been quite a popular um, view that having high dose vitamin C can help you fight colds. Certainly you need a little bit of vitamin C because that's important for your immune system. But that doesn't mean to say that high doses are necessarily going to protect you any further. Um, if you want to give a bit, bit of vitamin C, then that's fine. If you have too much in your body, it's easy enough to wee out the excess. Um, but. Uh, no, I'm afraid that those sorts of nutritional supplements don't have much evidence to support them. Um, so, uh, CA Survival, ABI, um, just trying to work out what the initials here, and aphasia, non-mobile three-year-old, little one with fourth run of antibiotics. How often could antibiotics be given for, and what would be alternative for long-term protection? Um, so if you are having repeated courses of antibiotics, um, then we might well consider using low-dose long-term antibiotic as a protection, particularly if you have underlying
vulnerabilities and that would require assessment by your paediatrician or by a respiratory paediatrician. Um, there's no absolute threshold for, for crossing. It rather depends on how severe the infections have been, how long a course of antibiotics you've needed each time. Um, the normal number, the average number of respiratory infections a child gets each year is seven to eight. That's an awful lot. I mean, and if you consider that they're during the winter months, that means they may well get a respiratory infection every single month through the winter months. That alone is not enough for saying that's abnormal, particularly if they recover well in between those infections, um, then we wouldn't make any special recommendations. Um, flu nasal vaccination has been given but we don't seem to avoid de developing chest infections. Well, flu will prevent the flu but it won't prevent you getting RSV, paraflu, rhinovirus, enterovirus, human metanumovirus, uh, bocovirus. There are so many viruses that cause winter infections. Um, we don't have immunizations against them all, um, but um, yeah, sometimes it's a matter of having exposure to them, building up your own immunity, and then hopefully in the future years, you will be, the child will be better protected and better able to withstand those infections. My son is on permanent cotrimoxazole, 10 mils a day. Will this prevent strep A? He has complex medical needs and we're worried about sending him to school. Yeah, septrin will have an effect against group A strep. It's not our first choice for group A strep, um, but it will have an effect um, and provide some protection. So, um, yes, I think you could send him to school. Again, I repeat what I've said before, most important is getting that flu immunization because flu is one of the viruses that will make you more susceptible to group A strep. Uh, if a child is on restricted diet due to sensory processing, would a multivitamin help? Um, may well do. If they're on a restricted diet, they should have a dietitian and you should have that dietetic advice to um, explain to you whether a multivitamin is help. If they're under five years, they should have multivitamin supplements anyway, particularly if they're on a restricted diet. Um, but for any child, if you wanted to give your child extra vitamins, you can do. You can buy them in the supermarkets. Don't give more than the recommended dose, because although if you get too much vitamin B, C, um, you will wee those out. If you get too much vitamin A or too much vitamin D, they're fat soluble and you don't wee those out in the same way. So you can get toxic if for having too much of those. So just give the recommended dose. Don't give more than um, is advised on the pot. Uh, how can I help my six-year-old boy nonverbal get rid of the cough? Um, yeah, a prolonged cough can be difficult uh, and sometimes it develops into what we call a habit cough. They just get used to coughing all the time. Um, there is a very good website called habitcough.com which gives you some very good tips about using a drink of water to help get rid of a habit cough. So if the child has developed cough as a bit of a habit and it's become a bit of a long-term thing, if they sit down and have a glass of water next to them and as soon as they get an urge to cough they take a sip of that glass of water the distraction can help them suppress the cough and it's about them learning to be able to suppress that cough and if they repeat that eventually the cough can sometimes be uh, got rid of altogether if it's a hang on from a respiratory infection one of the universal medications or it's not a medication substances that can help cough is honey um, there are even trials that have been done to show that honey is beneficial and there are multiple ways you can have honey it can just be a spoonful of it it can be in a warm drink it can be given in all sorts of ways it doesn't need to be any special honey you don't need to pay lots of money for manuka honey 
but you can just buy ordinary honey and sometimes that can be very soothing and often far more effective than anything you're going to buy in a chemist for suppressing a cough. Uh, does inhalation with saline solutions help? Yes, particularly if the airway gets a bit dry. Um, and the airway is more likely to get dry if the nose is blocked and your mouth breathing all the time. Then that can dry out the throat, dry out the larynx and the bronchi and the lungs. Uh, and therefore inhaling saline solutions can help that and make the airway less irritated and can reduce um, problematic cough. Um, my son is unable to blow his nose. Is there any other way we can relieve his congestion, his 12? So not sure if he can take decongestions. Another very good question because nasal blockage is a big source of irritation. It's not considered usually a serious medical emergency or life-threatening emergency, but it's, it's an absolute pain if you get terrible nasal blockage and you can't breathe through your nose, it interrupts your sleep. You start mouth breathing, you get a dry mouth that causes um, more irritation of the lower airway because you're bri breathing dry air in through the mouth. So trying to unblock your nose is important. Um, and there are many things you can do if, if you can't blow your nose. The first thing is just a simple saline spray. So Calpol do a saline spray, there are others as well. Um, it's usually just salt water, matches the salt water in our body and blood. Um, and you can give salt, plain salt water as often as you want um, and it just loosens the secretions so that they are either going to drip forwards and out the nose or they drip to the back of the nose and down the throat and are swallowed. Um, if saline doesn't work um, or they're, you can see secretions are in the nose or hear them and they, they're difficult to shift, you can buy little bulb aspirators which is just a little piece of plastic tubing with a little bulb attached to it that you can aspirate, suck out the secretions from the nose. If that doesn't work, you can buy in the supermarket some Otravine um, nasal spray or nasal drops. They're even available for infants and babies. Um, they shrink the lining of the nose, so they reduce inflammation in the nose. They can strip the blood vessels, they reduce runny noses, they make the nasal passage bigger so that you can breathe through it and there is a spray that is available for adults and can be used in children six years and above as well and it's very effective at clearing the nose uh, and it lasts up to 10-12 hours so it's just used twice a day. Don't use it in excess and don't use it for longer than seven days because if you do use it in excess or for longer than seven days you will get a rebound effect when you stop it. It will start causing even worse nasal blockage. Um, but Otravine is a very good medicine for short-term use for treating blocked noses. So that's saline, an aspirator, bulb aspirator, or Otravine nasal drops or Otravine nasal spray. Um, beyond that, um, it's more difficult. If you have long-term nasal blockage, sometimes we use nasal steroids to unblock the nose, reduce the adenoids at the back of the nose. <clears throat> and some nasal steroids can be bought in the chemist uh, or supermarket. Um, there's one called Beconase that is on the shelf in a supermarket that's marketed for treating hay fever. But really that's something, if you've got to that stage where it's a long-term problem, you probably should be seeing your GP to discuss use of that sort of treatment. <coughs> so, Amanda's asked, is there an antibiotic shortage? The government says no, but lots of doctors are telling families there is. Yeah, it's, it's not a shortage of antibiotic production, but it's a shortage of the suspensions and particularly of distribution of antibiotics. So it's, it's a localised thing. There are some chemists not getting antibiotics and in some areas that seems to be causing what appears to be a shortage and that you can't get them anywhere. <clears throat> so it is real. Um, and I think I've mentioned that there are, if, if your child does need antibiotics and 
there are problems getting suspensions. An alternative is to give them solid antibiotics and for some of the antibiotics you can crush them and put them into water or if it's a capsule you can open the capsule and put the granules or powder into water to give it orally or give it in a spoonful of yogurt or jam or something or you can even put it in a bit of water and put it down a tube. So solid antibiotics can be taken. We do try and encourage children to take solid medicines at a younger and younger age nowadays. Uh, they're often uh, cheaper, they're often easier to get hold of, they are often um, going to have less side effects um, and so uh, oh, they also may not need to be kept in the fridge so if a child can use solid medicines we recommend that. Um, the difficulty in swallowing medicines is often psychological because actually most tablets that you take by mouth to swallow them are they're often smaller than the bolus of food that you have at the end of swallowing some food or uh, chewing some food so the tablet is often smaller than the bolus of food that you swallow so there shouldn't be any problem swallowing tablets <clears throat> but many children uh, and often adults too have problems swallowing tablets and there's a graded system you can use for learning to swallow tablets you can start with uh, hundreds and thousands <clears throat> just putting them on your tongue or a little spoonful of them and just swallowing them um, and then you can graduate up to sprinkles cake sprinkles and then the silver balls you get put on cake decorations um, and then you can go up to an even bigger size solids such as tic tacs and swallow those um, but so it's it's possible for children to learn how to swallow solid medicines at, at, at often at all ages but certainly from five years of age and onwards. Um, right, mine have all had their nasal vaccine. Luckily they did as my son did contract tonsillitis and borderline strep A. I think if he hadn't have had the vaccine he would have been worse. He did have to have a course of antibiotics which worked brilliantly. Okay, so yeah, uh, good that he's, he's had effective treatment. Is strep the same as staph? No, streptococcus is one bacteria, group of bacteria. Staphylococcus is another group of bacteria. They're both very common bacteria. Um, Staphylococcus is often sitting on the skin uh, but can cause infections inside the body. Um, they're less common than strep at causing infections although they often do infect eczema and they often do cause <coughs> little boils, boils in the skin and sometimes they will cause abscesses. Um, since we saw you three years ago and you prescribed my son <clears throat> low grade antibiotics three times a week from September to March. He's not had his persistent and recurrent chest infections which we were, were so debilitating him and causing him to have so much time off school. I can't thank you enough. Oh good, okay. So azithromycin has worked well. Wonderful. Good to hear that. Um, how can we help them as they have chest infection who is asthmatic but it affects more at night time first thing early in the morning is propping them up right or not to help them having Vic yeah I didn't mention with a nasal blockage you can also use Vic Sinex and the little sticks you just put at the edge of the nostril they can be helpful as well to help breathing through the nose um, propping the child up on pillows is fine if that's what seems to help that's fine um, and it's difficult when they're getting symptoms at night time because that's when the body's steroid system and other hormones are at lows and you are more likely to get more chest problems at that time. Also, if you've been asleep and not moving around, um, secretions have got time to build up. So that's when you may start to hear more coughing and particularly first thing on waking. Um, so keeping the nose clear, keeping the um, uh, air cool may be helpful um, and so, I mean some children need physiotherapy, chest physiotherapy in the night and sometimes doing a session of that can be helpful to keep them uh, free of secretions uh, 
from uh, building up and causing problems in the morning. Um, some won't have COVID jab as is scared. <clears throat> yeah, I, to be honest, COVID in children I'm less concerned about as long as they've had the flu jab or flu spray. That's more important. Um, I think it's about talking to your provider who's going to give the jab if there's some way you can um, try and make it a good experience for him. Um, because again, this is largely psychological. The pain is not significant. Um, it's, it's a very um, quick, short um, prick in the skin. So it's, it's not a, a sustained or bad pain. Um, and it's about trying to find the right techniques for explaining it to the child. The difficulty is they've had a, a surprise bad experience in the past that was not maybe managed in the best way. Um, but uh, I think that's about talking to the person who's likely to be giving it, about finding a way to make it an easier experience. Are, chi are children with APERT syndrome and asthma prone to colds and flu? Where could I find the proof as the OT salt are not accepting this fact? Um, <clears throat> then they're not necessarily more prone to colds and flu than other children because their immune system should be working okay. But if they do get colds and flu, they are probably slightly more at risk of it going to their chest. Um, where can you find the proof? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I can't think of a reference off the top of my head that talks about um, APERT syndrome and respiratory infections, but certainly asthma is considered to be an at-risk group for getting lower respiratory infections and certainly makes them all the more uh, required to have flu vaccine for example and you'll find that in uh, the literature that the government department of health have on the internet my son with down syndrome is at two schools and effectively three classrooms i'm scared about uh, invasive group a strep because a child that died within 24 hours and barely showed any symptoms and it presents differently in down syndrome do you think it's safe to send him in <clears throat> Also, I gave his teacher an antiseptic spray to put on his hands a few times a day. Can I do anything else to prevent him catching it? Um, as I've said, flu immunisation will probably help reduce the risk of him getting group A strep. Um, yes, group A strep can get into the system, cause a sore throat, high fever, um, and then it can make you very sick very quickly. So septicemia typically can come on within 24 hours. Um, and cause a child to become very ill or even kill them. Fortunately, that is rare. Um, I think the key thing is that people need to just, whoever's got care of a child, they need to be aware that if a child has a very high fever, isn't behaving in their normal way, looks very mottled, um, has got cold hands and feet, bad muscle aches, very s bad sore throat, um, then they probably need to be seen by a medical practitioner to assess whether this is a strep infection or not. Um, but in the absence of those, I think, yeah, the children benefit so much from going to school, from socialisation. And of course, they are going to pick up infections, but this is all a way that their immunity will be helped to build up resistance to those infections in the future. So I... I would have, try and avoid keeping your child off school uh, because of concerns. Um, I think it is important that they do attend school, um, but uh, I'm afraid they are going to be prone, particularly this time of year and particularly this year, getting respiratory infections. And I think it's because in 2022, COVID relaxations happened, everyone was mixing more, and we started to have the spread of the bugs that we had stayed away from for two years. And I think this has been a big problem for some um, 
young children, particularly the one, two, three-year-olds who've had less exposure earlier on in their lives in the first two years of life, now they're going back into school environments. Some of these bugs are causing much more serious illness than they have in previous years. And it's because they're having their first exposure to some of them. <clears throat> um, my son had whooping cough at 17 weeks. He has autism, low verbal. Can he be catching it everything worse as a result of this? Yeah, whooping cough can cause damage to the airways called bronchiectasis. Um, it's a form of chronic bronchitis that can make you more prone to getting chest infections each time you get a cold or cough. So yes, it can make you more prone. And if they are prone and getting repeated infections, that's something that probably should be assessed by a respiratory paediatrician. But there are many children who have whooping cough at a young age where it doesn't cause long-standing damage and who are no more vulnerable to catching coughs and colds than any other children. What's a really high temperature? Above 39 is a high temperature, so below 39 we would say is a sort of mild or moderate temperature. Can you briefly explain the difference between a viral and a bacterial infection and how treatments differ? Is there any benefit from prescribing antibiotics preventatively in a vulnerable child with a virus? Okay, so viruses are tiny structures. They are composed of a very simple amount of genetic material, um, DNA or RNA, and they get into the body and they enter the cells and cause infection that way. Bacteria are bigger organisms and they are not just a bit of genetic material in a, in a shell. They are cells that are much more organized, have a, a much bigger amount of genetic material and cause a much bigger reaction in the body. Um, there's no dividing line between viruses and bacteria in terms of whether it can kill you or not, because viruses can kill you. You know, you take a, 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 some viruses, uh, even in this season, unfortunately, flu virus can kill, even otherwise healthy children. Um, fortunately, it's very rare, but you know, viruses can be dangerous. And as I say, this season we're seeing that happening to a much more severe degree, probably coming out of the pandemic. Bacteria, as a group, they probably cause more serious infections, but that's not always the case. Many bacterial infections are mild, and many children can recover from bacterial infections without antibiotics. If it's thought the child has a viral infection, there's no point giving antibiotics to prevent a bacterial infection. The only reason the doctor might give antibiotics would be because they're not sure whether it is just a virus or whether they have got a bacterial infection. And if they're not sure and the child's unwell enough or got significant consequences or complications, then they may err on the side of caution and give antibiotics anyway. Right, my daughter has a reaction to amoxicillin and apparent reaction is violent sickness and rash. Oh, I've answered that apparently. Salbutamol is normally used to help with breathing, struggling. However, it seems to make an inte uh, them intensely agitated and plummets his blood pressure. This is normally remedied by adjustments of propranolol. What can be used as an alternative? Okay. Um, so propranolol isn't something that's usually given to children unless there's some other underlying condition, usually some sort of heart problem or heart rhythm problem. Sometimes it's given to reduce stress and anxiety, but actually the propranolol is quite good at reducing blood pressure. Um, so it may be that that's more the problem. Subutamol is an asthma medicine, a blue inhaler, and it helps to relax the muscle around the air passages in the lungs. Um, and one of its common side effects is behavioural. It causes agitation, restlessness, um, 
excitability. Sometimes the children just go wild when they're on high dose salbutamol. Um, the thing to do is probably to reduce the dose of salbutamol, not necessarily stop it, just give a lower dose. And maybe it won't have such a big effect around their body. <coughs> the main way we give salbutamol is, of course, by um, inhaled um, medicine, giving it through a, uh, a spray, an inhaler, through a spacer device. Um, and that will mean it's just getting to the lungs where it's needed. Um, so that is a preferable way of giving salbutamol and helps to minimize the side effects in the body. If you aren't using a spacer device, you should be because that will help reduce the absorption into the rest of the body and just target it in the lungs and airways. Um, what else have we got? My son has type 1 diabetes, ASD, sensory processing, and it's extremely stressful and hard work when he's unwell, keeping his blood glucose at a safe level and keeping on his ketones. Trying to get him to eat um, is extremely hard, so he doesn't understand any tips. Yeah, I think the issue there is that if he's a diabetic, you need to find out when he's unwell, what is it that he will take that has a calorie source, a sugar source in it, so that you can maybe give him a little bit of that on a regular basis um, so that he keeps his sugar levels up and stops them from plummeting. How do you teach a child to blow their nose? Okay, um, the best way children learn is by example, so getting adults and peers to see um, them blowing their nose and then they will eventually learn and get the hang of it. Um, he has Down syndrome, still can't do it. Yeah, it, it can be difficult for some children with Down syndrome. Um, and then he blows into the tissue from his mouth, not his nose. Yeah, well, maybe try and put a short straw into his nostril and see if you can get him to blow a piece of tissue paper with it. Um, it may be a revolting thing. It may have quite unpleasant consequences, but if he tries to use his nose to blow things or even a, a little straw and a bit of a pee or something round on a table and see if he could blow that across the table, that might teach him how to blow out through his nose rather than his mouth. Um, my son is nil by mouth. Is it still safe to give a saline spray up his nose? Um, yes, it is. He's unlikely to swallow much of it, so it's absolutely safe to give a nasal spray up his nose. How long after colistin or Dornay's nebs should you wait before suction? Uh, good question. I'd probably give it at least 10-15 minutes. Um, if you can wait that long before giving suction, I presume you're talking about oronasal suction. Um, so, um, yeah, wait that long. Um, drooling is keeping my son's chin and chest wet, getting loads of colds and blockages. Yeah, if you do have a child who's drooling an awful lot, um, that just becomes much more of a problem and a headache when they get a respiratory infection and there are medicines that can reduce the drooling. Um, the simplest thing is to get some quells which are anti-sickness tablets from your chemist. Um, they've got hyacin in which stops travel sickness but they also reduce um, drooling. Um, and just give the lowest dose. There are two doses, 150 and 300 micrograms. They're scored so you can break them in half. So the smallest dose you can give is 75 uh, micrograms. Just give that um, and you can give it every six to eight hours. That may reduce drooling. And we use similar medicines long term in children who have persistent problems drooling. So for example, related to hyacin is atropine. Um, we also use um, atropine eye drops sometimes. They have to be prescribed. They can be used in the mouth to dry up secretions. And of course, long term, we use a hyacinth patch, which many children with neurodisability will be familiar with. 
There's also a medicine called Cyalinar, which is its chemical name is glycopyrrolate or glyco, which is very good at reducing secretions. So if you don't use it regularly, it can be used as necessary when a child gets a cold to reduce the amount that they're drooling. Is it true some decongestants can cause a higher risk of strokes? Um, I think if you're giving the Otravine nasal spray that I talked about in a high dose, they do cause constriction of the blood vessels in the nose to reduce the secretions. If you give a very high dose of that, yes, there's a risk of strokes, but you'd be having to give very high doses for it to cause that as a problem or a side effect, you know, way over what is recommended. Um, <clears throat> so difference between nasal flu and flu injection. Um, they're both good, they're both very, very effective. Um, even if you've got a bit of a runny or blocked nose, the flu spray can be effective. Um, even if they sneeze afterwards, it can be effective. Um, yeah, if they're needing attenuated doses, so doses that aren't going to cause illness, um, the flu injection is generally recommended. Um, actually, the, the the flu in the nasal spray is a bit attenuated, so um, I don't think it's such a big problem. And um, I think you can give nasal flu even if your child has Down syndrome. Uh, we used Emla numbing cream, which you can buy over the counter, which has made a huge difference as my, our son has had many painful medical procedures in the past. Oh, this relates as an answer for the immunization. Yeah. You can put that on the skin. I didn't know you can buy it in the chemist over the counter, but that's really helpful. Yeah, put Emla cream um, on the skin. That will numb the skin. Skin. Um, you can get the child to practice that at home, I guess, and show them that actually they're not going to feel this jab. Um, if a child is poorly, does a sore neck come with strep A? Yes, they get a very, very intensely sore throat. and it's more likely to be strep A if they don't have a runny nose. If you have a runny nose with it, it's more likely to be a viral infection. Um, feel better about sending my child to school, good. Um, thank you for so much advice, I'm here. I just wanted to spread awareness of Lemier syndrome that my daughter had, as many doctors haven't heard of it. Just got people to be aware of their child gets sepsis symptoms or sickness and diarrhea with tonsillitis, rush them to get checked. Yeah, Lemier syndrome is where if you have a tonsillitis, the in infection and inflammation spreads it beyond the tonsils and into the neck and can cause inflammation of other structures in the neck. And most important is the blood, big blood, blood vessels in the neck. So it can cause quite serious problems that way. Um, usually if your child is very sick, got a very sore throat, can't swallow, high, very high temperature, very sore neck, doesn't move their head very much, not quite with it. Yes, get them checked out. Lemier syndrome is one of those fortunately rare complications of tonsillitis and sore throats. Um, how are we doing? Both my children are waiting for assessment of autism. When unwell, they do not present like typically unwell children. They can't communicate when they're in pain. And one I'm sure doesn't feel pain and will be jumping around with lots of energy, even with a 40 degree fever. I feel medical professionals dismiss, dismiss us as the behavior doesn't suggest severe illness. I've had to fight the GP for an appointment, but when their OBS were taken, they were rushed to hospital with suspected sepsis. How can I get taken seriously and get help quickly for my children out of hours? You could learn to take your child's heart rate and temperature and respiratory rate. So you take your own observations of your own child when they're unwell so that you feed those to the practice nurse or receptionist or your GP or 111 or whoever you're speaking to. Um, and many people nowadays, through particularly through COVID, have bought these cheap eximeters on the internet. You can even take your child's own oxygen saturation measurements with those, and it, you can present those observations. And maybe that would be a way that you would better get uh, 
uh, noticed and earlier intervention for your child if they don't respond in the usual way with symptoms or communication. Okay, we oh yeah, we are ten past twelve, so I think we've um, really reached the end of the session. I hope that's been helpful, and I just want you all to stay well. Um, if you know people have got bad coughs and colds, stay away from them. Um, eat healthily, get outside, get your flu immunizations. For the adults, definitely get your COVID immunizations, and um, yeah, maybe see you again in the future. Thanks very much for your time and attention this morning and um, yeah, stay healthy this winter. Goodbye.